Can you all see me? Hello? 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 Yes, sir. You are audible and visible. Are you, uh, am I visible? Uh, you are audible now, not visible. Okay, so I Just have turned the camera you. on. Let me. Yeah, please. <clears throat> yes, now you are visible. Okay. Yes, yes, fine. Sir. <sighs> Sorry for the inconvenience. We'll start in. <laughs> no problem. Uh, but if for some reason the uh, you know audio is coming really, really, uh, you know, uh, low from from you, I okay, can I hard. Will, I will try to fix see it. See what can be done. <clears throat> That's fine. I'll be able to manage. Shall we start, sir? Introduction? Yes, you, you, you can start now. Yes. Good morning, one and all present here. Many thanks to our group head, Mr. Devraj Banerjee, ISMS, for giving me this opportunity to be here. I feel extremely privileged to introduce Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay, today's honorable guest speaker for this live session, directly from California, US, for the first year induction of international MBA program organized by International School of Management Studies. Mitali, ma'am. I'm introducing, sir. Is that fine? Mitali, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I'm already started introducing him. Any problem? No, ma'am. I will continue. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Dr. Gautam Chattopadhyay is a senior scientist at the NASA State Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology, a visiting professor at the Division of Physics, Mathematics, and Astronomy at the California Institute of Technology, Pasadena, USA. A BEL Distinguished Visiting Chair Professor at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and an Adjunct Professor at the Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. He received the PhD degree in electrical engineering for, from the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, Pasadena. In 2020, he is a fellow IEEE and IETE and uh, IEEE. Just a, <clears throat> give me a second. Distinguished lecturer. His research interests include microwave, millimeter wave, tetrahertz receiver systems and radars and development of space instruments for the search for life beyond Earth. He has more than 350 publications in international journals and conferences and holds more than 20 patents. He also received more than 35 NASA technical achievements and new technology invention awards. He received the IEEE Regional Six Engineer of the Year Award in 2018, Distinguished Alumni Award from the Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology, India in 2017. He was the recipient of the Best Journal Paper Award in 2020 and 2013 by IEEE Transactions on Tetrahertz Science and Technology. Best Paper Award for Antenna Design and Applications at the European Antennas and Propagation Conference in 2017 and IETE Professor Asan Mitra Memorial Award in 2014. At the end, I would like to add that he's not only an extremely scholarly person, but I have seen him as an overall good human being who has immense contribution to the society at the same time down to our person. So everyone, please put your hands together and give him a warm welcome. Sir, I request you to take over the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. I hope everyone can hear me now. 
uh, I'm really sorry uh, that there was some technical, you know, uh, glitches. Uh, uh, you know, in today's day and age, we can land something on Mars, but we always have some technical difficulties with Zoom and the PowerPoint. So I'm really sorry about no, that. It's okay. <laughs> uh, so we are happy hope, that uh, you are here. Uh, so it's late night here. It's past 10 p.m. I feel 10, 12 p.m. right now. Uh, so this is okay. So I'm really excited to be uh, you know, amongst you all. Uh, and I want to welcome you all to your new career that most of you have joined in. The students who are you know, attending this, you have joined in for a management degrees. Uh, I have no uh, you know, formal uh, education in management. I'm just an ordinary scientist. So I was thinking that what kind of you know, uh, advice that I can give you, uh, you know, because I, as I said, I do not really have any formal education in that area. So I thought maybe I will focus more on leadership. So if I was meeting you all in person, what I would have done that I would have go, gone around the room and asked you all to tell me what is your concept of a leader that what makes a leader? Because once you study in this institute and then you graduate and go on to the real world, most of you will be you know, put in a position of leadership. So you will be a leader in your area. You will be leading uh, a lot of efforts. So what is your concept of a leader? So what makes a good leader? So that I would have asked. So also, you know that if you ask me, what makes uh, someone a good leader. I have, since I'm a scientist, uh, most often we have some kind of equation in mind. So I think that we can put together an equation of a leader. So, okay, so you might be already, uh, some of you might be already leaving the Zoom thinking that, okay, <laughs> I'm bringing in some equations, but bear with me, let me try to explain what I mean uh, by having an equation for a leader. So let's talk a little bit about you know, thermodynamics in this. <laughs> Again, uh, you know, don't leave the meeting yet. So I will try to explain it to you what is the connection between thermodynamics and leader. So in thermodynamics, there is a very beautiful equation, what is called uh, you know, Stephen Boltzmann equation. So there are two scientists from Austria in 1870s. They came up with a very simple equation describing thermodynamics. What it says, that equation, the thermodynamic equation of Stephen uh, Boltzmann equation says that suppose if you, if you take something and heat it up, let's say a iron that you use for ironing your clothes, if you, you know, if you connect it, it starts heating up. So if you heat that up, and then if you put your hand close to that iron, what you are going to feel some heat, what is happening that heat energy is coming from, iron, from that iron and coming towards you. And they put together an equation for that heat, the amount of energy, that, that heat energy that is coming out from somebody which is kept at temperature T. What it says, the amount of energy that is coming per unit area per second is proportional to the T to the temperature to the power four of that body. So in simple terms, it means that if you increase the temperature of that iron by factor of two, total amount of heat energy that will come will increase by a factor of 16. So that's all it says. So now you know a little bit of thermodynamics of Stephen Boltzmann equation. So you must be wondering, so what it has to do with leadership uh, or, uh, or your studies, right? So I have also an equation when it, it connects to similar to the thermodynamics. I say the leadership actually is proportional again to T to the power four, which means T times T times T times T. But this T that I, we are talking about of leadership is not temperature. There are four different T's associated with any leader. So first of those T is the team. Whenever you are talking about leadership, you will be leading a group of people. You'll be leading a team. So pay attention to your team. So always try to, sometimes you can actually cannot 
get the team that you want because you are given a team to work with. However, you will have to make that team work for a common goal. And that is the, uh, one of the you know, salient features of a leader that they're very successful in doing that. So I, I'll give you an example. So what I do, you know, in our team, when I am working for some big project, then of course I'm dealing with a lot of people. We have a team and, you know, in our team, we have a lot of people of different kind, right? You know, one person does soldering. They just, you know, day in and day out, they put together circuits doing soldering. So if you ask someone who does that job, if you ask them, what do you do? What is your role? That person will tell that, oh, my job is soldering, right? However, the work that he does is very important because his or her work actually makes or breaks a big system. So what I do is that I actually ask everyone, everyone who is working in that project, even that person is just doing soldering, I actually call them and give them the big picture. I tell them what exactly we are trying to do. One example could be that we, I am currently working on a mission to a, an instrument that will go to Mars and try to measure the winds on Martian atmosphere from an orbit. This is a big instrument. The cost of the instrument will be about $60 million. And there are a lot of people working on that. And one of them is actually a person who does soldering. However, I explain to them what exactly we are trying to do, what kind of instrument we are trying to build, what it's going to do at the end of the day. So as, a, as that person who is even doing the soldering, he also feels part of that. He sees the big, he or she sees the big picture that is going on. As a result, when you ask that person what that person does, he or she is not going to say that I'm, I do soldering. That person is going to say, I am part of a team that is building an instrument that will go to Mars and measure the winds on Mars that has never been done before. So that's what the team part of these four T's that I talk about is, that everyone has to feel that they're part of that, that doing something that is really important. So that is one of the uh, most important aspects of leadership. The second one that I talk about is actually trust. For success for everyone it, and your, the team and for your project depends on that you have to trust your team members. You will have to really give them the responsibility and trust that they're going to do their best. How do you instill trust in people? So that part you have to always think about because if Whenever there is success comes, you have to spread the success to everyone. However, if something goes wrong, the buck stops with you as a leader. You'll have to take responsibility. You'll have to tell everyone that, okay, it is, I am the one who is responsible, which means you are trusting your team members and your team members now know that you have their back. So this is one of the fundamental aspects of leadership that trust. The third part is transparency and truth. This is very, very important because, you know, when you are leading some effort and that happens in everyday life as well, not always things are going to go right. Something might not work. However, you'll have to tell the truth. You'll have to be transparent about it. You'll have to tell everyone that, okay, you know what? we are failing in these areas. These are the areas that are, we see problem. Do not hide. If you do, that's when you are going to lose your, the trust of your you know, team members as well. So truth and transparency are very important when you are leading any effort, not only to your team, also to your upper management, to the people who are actually uh, uh, you know, answering to they also should know if there's any problem, they should know, they should know, you know, well in advance. So this is very important part. And the fourth T is treatment. 
because equality and diversity, that you treat everyone with respect. You treat each and every member because you know what happens is sometimes you'll find that some team members are weak in some areas. However, they might be better in some other areas. So you do not treat them differently in the sense that you do not really discriminate against. So treatment of equality and having a diverse team, these things are you know, most important assets that a leader can have. So also, I believe that the best asset that one can have is human asset. If you think about all these four T's, you know, your equation of the leadership is proportional to the is to, uh, to T to the power four. If you think about it, everything boils down to your human assets because that is the best asset that you have. You will have to lead from the front and you have to lead with empathy. When you do that, you will find that, uh, you know, you the success will come. So I, I am quite certain that when you actually go to the, you know, if you study here at, at this great institution, and then you are going to go out, and if you follow this, you know, particular power four equation and lead with empathy, you are going to touch people's life and you will be making it count. So it's very, very important that actually you imbibe these qualities, these leadership qualities in you. So this is, with, with this actually, I want to open this up. I want to keep this one more of a question and answer session. So that is what my equation for leadership is. So that's what, when I lead to in some projects, so I try to imbibe these qualities. And I have seen, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, uh, success or failures, uh, you know, is part of, part and parcel of everyday life. So, you know, you'll have to take failure in your stride and learn from it. But if you follow some of these things, what I said, I, I believe that you'll be successful in your career. So, uh, you know, I'll be more than happy to answer your questions because I did, you know, as I said, that things did not really work out in the, uh, in the technical glitches. So I cannot share any, uh, you know, materials, any screen or anything. Um, so I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. You are muted. Yeah. Uh, dear students, am I audible? Yes. Uh, I can so hear. If you have any questions, students, you can raise your hands. We can make you, you know, Available to speak. Anyone available? Any question you have? Okay, so in the meantime, can you please uh, describe a little bit about what is uh, empathy really mean at this stage? Like students are here to enter to the corporate. So they are here to learn what is leadership at the same time, how to empathize with the team members in case you can throw some light. Yeah, that's uh, it, I, as I, I, as I mentioned uh, that you know uh, as you 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 are getting into a very complex world, right? As you study now, you see and look around you that uh, things are not going to be as simple as it was when you are doing your you know uh, school studies and then you are doing your college. So things get more complex. However, that you are now going to get tools to handle uh, you know, those complexities. But as at the same time, as I said, basic understanding of any subject matter is the most important. When you are entering this, you know, this part of your you know, you know, education now, try to understand the basic concept. What I have found in my life that I actually have never run after marks or the numbers. You know, in our education system, at least in India, we have something like, you know, we always are asking, okay, what is your, what percentage of marks that you got? You know, did you come first? Did you come second? So there are too much of emphasis placed on those aspects of education. To me, I believe that if you understand the fundamentals, the basics well, then, you know, no matter what, you will have the tools 
to actually deal with the complex problems that you are going to face. Because you will be given, uh, uh, you know, you, you will encounter that you are in, uh, you know, executing a big project and you'll be dealing with a lot of people, a lot of complexities, a lot, lot of ups and downs. However, if your basic understanding of the subject matter, if your basic understanding of the overall system that you are actually going to deliver, you have a clear understanding of that, you will find it very, uh, you know, much easier to deal with that. So always focus on understanding the basics instead of don't get, you know, uh, you know, get uh, uh, carried away by a lot of new things nowadays happening. If you go into this, a lot, lot of terminologies are used. You know, it's okay, let, we need to use AI, you need to use this, you need to use that, machine learning. Yes, all those are very, very important, but you'll have to understand what AI does, what machine learning does. You'll have to really understand the basics of that. If you do, I'm sure that you are all will be uh, successful. Sir, you have such a vast experience in NASA. So can we uh, have a little, you know, chunk of the experience that you have over there? Uh, can you please share? The audience is very eager to know, students, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yes. So, yes. Yeah. So I actually sometimes don't believe, you know, I pinch myself. As I, when I was a kid growing up, I used to, I used to dream uh, to be working at NASA, I used to, you know, you know, sky. When you look up in the sky, that always excites us, right? We see all these twinkling stars, and if we ask ourselves, you know, from where all those things are coming from? Who are we? How all these things came about, right? Where where the universe started? So those questions are used to really, you know, intrigue me, and it it does even today, and we still don't know that well you know that okay, how all these things came about we don't know all the details of it and that is the most exciting part and also you know the big question that we always ask ourselves that are we alone in this universe right is there life outside our own planet so these are the uh, you know fundamental questions that used to intrigue me and then i uh, of course I, I i worked hard i studied hard and i came to the us to do my phd at Caltech, California Institute of Technology. And then I got a call from NASA when I was finishing up my PhD uh, that uh, they asked me uh, if I'm uh, interested in joining NASA. So you can, uh, you know, take, you know, you can uh, guess what was my kind of excitement when I heard that question. I, of course, said, yes, of course, I'm very much interested. And they, you know, asked me to go over to JPL for an interview. And then, uh, you know, from there, they offered me a job. And sometimes I really, uh, again, you know, I do not believe myself that I am actually uh, working with all these really talented people who come from all over the world. So the lot, of the projects that I have, I'm involved in, actually, I develop technology and also the conceptualize new instruments that are going to make if I uh, try to answer fundamental science questions. So one of the things that, you know, I, an instrument that I'm building right now, I have designed and building right now, is to answering a very fundamental question that when our art was formed, there is no water. The question is that how did all this water came to our planet Earth? It turns out the scientists believe that comets, the Dhumke, Comets actually brought water to us. So if I ask you, you know, this, this question, if tell you the answer that, okay, comets brought water to us, you say, okay, how do you prove that? How do you really go about proving that kind of, uh, you know, question? What you can do, it turns out that the water has different colors. What do I mean by colors is that if, if there are different kinds of water. The water that we drink every day is H260 no. Oxygen has different isotopes, right? The most stable isotope is uh, 16. So if you take two hydrogen and one uh, you know, uh, oxygen of 16, uh, that isotope, it forms water. That is the most abundant water we drink every day. However, there are other kinds of water. There are H217O, H216O, and uh, HDO. One deuterium, one hydrogen, and one oxygen also makes water. So if you take ratios of different abundances of water, there is some, uh, some numbers that you are going to get. It turns out that the, our earth's water ratio that you know, uh, 
these uh, different abundances of water ratio is very similar to what we see on comets. However, we have done only, only a few handful of such measurements. So I am currently building in a very small instrument that can go to a comet and make those measurements and see what are the ratios of different kinds of water. And then it can answer definitively that question that yes, you know, uh, these uh, comets brought water to Earth. So what is the fundamental idea behind that? Because we are trying to actually find sign of life on other planets, they're called exoplanets. And then we, we, when we are looking for life, we are looking for the kind of life that we know about that is hydrocarbon based life. And for them to happen, uh, to ex that kind of life to exist, we need uh, oxygen, we need water. So if we know that what is the origin of water in planet Earth, then we can actually connect these dots and see, okay, if there's an exoplanet out there, how the water in that planetary system will happen. So I am building instruments like that. Also, I am also working on uh, some astrophysics instruments. What that does actually, when at the beginning of the universe, we, uh, we believe that we started with the Big Bang. You know, many of you know Big Bang theory. Also, <laughs> this is not the Big Bang, Big Bang theory you watch on TV. This is the real Big Bang theory. In that, actually, we, we go back in time and try to go back at the beginning of the universe and try to understand what exactly happened. So I am developing instrumentation. The most sensitive instrument, most sensitive detectors that you can ever build to you know, understand what happened at the beginning of the universe. And I am also involved in developing instrumentation to know about the climate change. It turns out that all the pollutants that we see, the transport of the pollutants happen in the upper you know, stratosphere. So we are building instruments to look into the upper stratosphere from space and we'll see how this transportation of the pollutants is working. So I, I am involved in building uh, those instruments. So I work uh, you know, across many areas of science, planetary science, astrophysics, as well as uh, you know, atmospheric sciences, where we try to connect uh, between science and the experiments. So that's what my role is. And uh, sir, with this, uh, can uh, we uh, can you please share about the you know recent Mars? Uh, uh, you know you have made a recent Mars. Uh, uh, what should I say? Uh, it's a uh, yeah, big a, thing. A rover, a rover, and a helicopter. Rover, yes. Rover. Yeah. So uh, can you please share uh, something for that, which is which has happened very recently, the recent Mars, uh, you know, uh, project which you had. Uh, yes, so I'm more than happy to tell you that because you all know that recently, you know, earlier this year, we landed a rover uh, uh, on Mars. Uh, some, some noise coming now. Uh, Rashmi, ma'am, some noise uh, are coming. Uh, Rashmi, ma'am, some noise are there. Can you please reduce? Yeah, can you please mute that? Rashmi ma'am, am I audible? Yeah, I, I, I can hear some background noise. Uh, yeah, I will, I will just call her. Yeah, it stopped now. Yeah. Yes, okay, okay, sure, absolutely. Sorry so, for that. Uh, uh, no problem. Uh, that yes, Mars Perseverance rover actually landed earlier this year, that was in February 2021. And uh, this is, uh, you know, landing on Mars is a very, very big challenge for all of us. You know, we have been successful in the last few attempts, you know, last con uh, six uh, last mission, all those missions have been successful in landing on Mars. However, it is extremely challenging. 
And perseverance rover has a lot of different instruments that are what we chose the location where to land very carefully. Uh, the where we have landed is called the zero crater. So that is an ancient lake bed. So once upon a time, there's a huge lake there. And however, if you go there now, we don't see any water, however, but we believe that there could be some signs of life uh, in, that, uh, in that area. So that's where we have sent the rover to do experiments. So one of the instrument that is there on Perseverance rover is trying to uh, take the carbon dioxide from Martian atmosphere. In Mars, the amount of oxygen is very, very low. So what this instrument is going to do is called MOXIE. It, is, it will it take carbon dioxide from the Martian atmosphere and will do some electrochemical process and create you know, oxygen from CO2. And we will store that oxygen and it has already started doing it and doing very well. So idea of that, that in future, when the astronauts go to Mars, they will be able to use the oxygen that is created from carbon dioxide. On top of that, you know, oxygen is a propulsion fuel. So, you know, to bring the astronaut back to Earth, we we'll be able to use the oxygen that is created from carbon dioxide and use as fuel to bring the astronauts back. So this is the idea. Uh, at the same time, also, we are actually, is the first step of, uh, something called Mars sample return. So we are trying to collect some samples from Martian surface and bring it back to Earth eventually. So in this mission, we are collecting the samples, not bringing them back because Perseverance rover is not coming back. So apart, so we'll be doing a lot of experiments. The main idea, main scientific motivation for this Perseverance rover is to answer this question was Mars ever habitable? Is there life on Mars today? We have not found any sign of life on Mars ever. But question is, is there sign of life Mars today? Or was Mars ever habitable? So these are the questions we are trying to answer through this rover. And uh, we also have sent a, a you know, in, uh, Ingenuity, a helicopter. So we are flying a helicopter on Mars for the first time we actually flew, and it has been very successful. Uh, then you might all ask that, what is the big deal of flying a helicopter on Mars? Because we have helicopter on planet Earth all the time. The problem on flying a helicopter on Mars is that Mars atmosphere is just 1% of Earth's atmosphere. So extremely light. As a result, if you want to fly something, then the rotor blades of helicopter that you need, they need to rotate really at a very high speed. That like if you compare that old helicopter from Earth, you know, on Earth, the helicopters, they rotate at the, the blades rotate at about 400 to 450 RPM, that revolution per minute. But on Mars to get the same kind of lift, you need to rotate at 2,500 to 3,000 RPM. That is a huge challenge and everything has to be much lighter. So we actually designed the helicopter. This is called Tech Demo, a technological demonstration that yes, we can fly something on Mars. So that's why we built this Ingenuity helicopter and it has been successful. We have, if, if uh, you know, my, uh, if uh, we are connected through my laptop, I could have shown you the, the flying of the helicopter on Mars. And we can also hear, we have put some audio uh, instruments as well, so we can hear that helicopter is flying on Mars. How the Martian wind sounds like, you can hear now uh, for the first time. Uh, so one of the thing that is going to do this flying helicopter on Mars is going to do that, you know, that we cannot fly a helicopter on planet Earth on very high altitude. Suppose we have to do some rescue operation on Himalayas, we cannot do because the atmosphere is so thin that the helicopter cannot fly. However, the technology that we have developed to, do, uh, to design the Mars helicopter will, be, will allow us to make high altitude rescue operations on planet Earth because we will have this capability now. And uh, you know, to, to disaster areas, we can go and fly at very high altitude. So that is, uh, these are very exciting time 
And uh, you know, we are, we are doing experiments on Mars right now with this uh, you know helicopter as well as uh, Perseverance rover. We will keep getting new data. So you know, keep uh, you know, stay tuned. Uh, sir, I know it's very late for you, but still I can't stop myself asking one very, you know, important question. That is, your life itself is a motivation for us. So uh, can you give some tips to our students that you have gone through? Like many of the students feels like their background is not as far that they can go so too high. Okay, but I know that you have come up from such level to a sky high level. So can you please motivate our students with few of your, you know, genuine example in life, which you have already faced and students will get motivated. Really, it's a live example for all of us. So can you please uh, throw some light? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, actually, yes, I believe that if you dream big, it, you know, uh, all of you, I will ask you to dream and dream big because one thing that it doesn't cost anything to dream. So, uh, you know, you dream big and work hard for it. So there is no alternative to hard work. So I, as uh, you know, the, the Taludar said that I actually grew up, uh, you know, outskirts of Kolkata. Uh, you know, we are, I am one of, you know, six, we have six brothers and sisters and my parents were very poor. Uh, and we did not even have, you know, uh, two meals a day. Uh, however, one thing my parents always said to work hard and study well, and that's what I did. And I always dreamed to be big and work for it. So with, with that, I was able to get a scholarship uh, during my undergraduate studies. And then again, I got a job at TIFR after I finished my undergraduate, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. However, you know, uh, if I did not stop dreaming because you have to think that, okay, where exactly, what exactly you want to do in your life? Uh, you know, what is your destiny? And can you really uh, get there? Never think that you cannot achieve your dreams if you only thing that you have to do is really work hard for it. So if you really work hard and keep your focus on where you want to go, I'm sure that you will achieve your dreams. Of course, there will be a lot of uh, you know, obstacles on the way. Key is to not to give up. You have every right, whenever failure comes, you have every right to brood over it for a day. Then you'll have to start thinking you know, that, okay, what I could have done better. That is one of the key. Even today, I always think, you know, suppose something doesn't work. And most often when you are dealing with experimental uh, stuff, always something doesn't work. So what you have to do is not to really give up. You'll have to think, you know, sit down, start thinking, go back in time for everything in life. That, okay, what are the steps that you have done? What are the steps that you could have done better? where you have gone wrong. If you start thinking about it and take corrective action, you will see that you are reaching somewhere that, uh, you know, that will help you in your uh, process. And at the end of the day, you know, what always look after your mental and physical health, that is most important and try to be a happy person. So I am a very happy person. Thank you, sir. Uh, ISMS is uh, today feeling really fortunate that we have a speaker like you present in between us. And at the same time, I know students has, you know, got motivated listening you. They can visualize, they could visualize NASA as you have described. Few of the, you know, can it be minuscule part, but still they have visualized NASA in your description. So, so looking forward for some more interactions, more discussions. I know uh, there is a less stored, you know, uh, in future. But uh, for this session, we, we are really thankful to you uh, that after a hard day, in a week day, you are still there to address us. That's a big thing for us. So no words to thank you so much. 
Thank you thank so you, much from ISMS. Thank you, sir. See you again. <clears throat> thank you very nice. much. I'm looking nice. forward to seeing you all in person in future after the pandemic sure. gets over. Sure, sir. Sure. Most welcome, sir. Bye, sir. Okay, Take bye. Care. Bye, sir. Bye.